remember the FDA asked the court to keep these documents hidden until we were all dead. And the, these documents, they never thought they'd see the light of day, right? Yeah. So they're really written, they're like Mengele's notebooks. Pfizer's language is vaccine failure and failure of efficacy. That's their words, yeah. one month after rollout. So everything that followed, the lockdowns, the kids out of school, the masking, the mandates, the forced injections, don't kill grandma. They knew it was all a lie. That And they then ran a huge propaganda campaign that summer with influencers on TikTok to get minors and young adults injected. Good morning, let's go get vaccinated. <laughs> and that was the era, and I will, as the mother of people that age, I'll never, for, and stepmother, I'll never forgive them for this because they knew it was causing heart damage in young adults. They knew young adults were not at risk from COVID. They knew the injections didn't stop COVID. And that was the summer in America, I don't know about Europe, where college students were mandated to get the injection if they wanted to come back to school. I was immediately deplatformed from Twitter, from Facebook, from YouTube, and a global smear campaign. But it, it overnight changed my bio everywhere in the world from all these nice things you just mentioned to conspiracy theorists, like crazy conspiracy theorists. Mm -hmm. And also these 250 lawyers who helped us sue Pfizer, sue the Justice Department, or write a letter to the Justice Department, uh, sue the Biden administration, sue the FDA. These reports document the greatest crime against humanity in recorded history. And it was an intentional crime. But I would say we got divine help because I can't explain it any other way. In America, we've driven down the uptake of the booster to 4%. So we were successful. We saved millions of lives. And we drove down Pfizer's uh, global uh, revenue to before 2016 levels. So we popped their economic bubble. It was 90% or something. Yeah. yeah. It becomes clear now that uh, political opponents of the Biden administrations in the last three and a half years are being thrown in prison. Oh, my God. And a lot of people. There are 40, almost 43,000 adverse events in three months in the Pfizer documents. These are industrial scale serious adverse events, including 1,225 fatalities, deaths. And in the Pfizer documents, there's a, a section where there's over 80% miscarriage or spontaneous abortion of the pregnancies. And in another section, there's an eight page pregnancy and lactation report, and it shows two babies died in utero. And according to Pfizer, the cause of death was maternal exposure to the vaccine virtually the centerpiece of the Pfizer documents is reproductive. Mm -hmm. It's aimed at male and female reproduction to damage it and destroy it. 15,000 women have two periods a month. 10,000 women have no periods, meaning they'll never have a baby. Uh, you know, 7,500 women um, bleed every day of their lives, meaning their lives are over, they're disabled, right? Uh, the... United Nations of Europe, as they were first called, uh, was uh, era the ERISE was founded in um, 1957 mm -hmm. by Walter Hallstein. He became president, mm -hmm. and he was a convicted war criminal in the Nuremberg trial. And there are more convicted war criminals. Operation Paperclip, and then 1,500 Nazi scientists, uh, also the camp doctors. They flew to the U.S. Right. and they were lecturing the CIA right. on mind control experiments. Oh wow! And uh, uh, so that's incredible. Yeah. What people also don't um, realize is what actually happens in the camps. And, you know, and they, and they work for labor, and they went to death with gas, and it was all terrible. And but. Uh, what fa factually happened, also what came a little bit out of the Nuremberg trials, uh, was that it wasn't the SS that was uh, really in charge. It were uh, doctors and scientists of companies, of Bus F, of all the chemical companies, and they were actually uh, involved in very sophisticated mind control experiments. And the smartest people in the world, like Stephen Hawkins, and, and but also Elon Musk, and people at Google, and many people in Silicon Valley, 
they say we live in a holographic universe. No, no. Or we live in a matrix. Oh, or no. we live in a simulation. Oh, I don't want to believe that. And, uh... I personally find that I gravitate more towards the information theoretic point of view and, and believing that uh, that I'm, I, the universe that I exist in is a very good, high quality simulation. And we have a, a placebo effect and we have a nocebo mm -hmm. effect, mm -hmm. which can, we can use in all kinds of ways, mm -hmm. but we can steer it. Interesting. So uh, you can say mm -hmm. that f with the vaccination, uh, for example, uh, backwards in time, mm -hmm. that you are deciding what they shot into you. Oh, wow. Well, today I'm sitting here in a hotel room in Zeist in the Netherlands with a woman who described in detail the current state of the world decades ago. She advocates to start over as a society, to rebuild every single institution as they are all corrupted to the core. Clean science and clean medicine with clean money and clean journalism. To make a start, she founded Liberty House for clean journalism, an education for journalists without the lying and cheating that we became so accustomed to in today's media. As her co-founder and CEO of dailycloud.io, and that is cloud with a T, she unleashes Liberty, it is her mission to empower people with information and facts, and if necessary, give bold support in legal cases, filing lawsuits against branches of the government or multinationals. There are about 250 lawyers that give support to her cases in one way or another. When the Pfizer papers were released, she gathered 3,500 doctors, scientists, plus all kinds of other experts, experts and with Amy Kelly, turned them into an unstoppable truth machine that made 85 reports out of the 350,000 pages. It turned out to be some of the most important journalism of our time. She was canceled and deplatformed eight times, not only by big tech, but also by the White House. In the before period, as she calls it, that is the before COVID period, she wrote eight bestseller books that have all been translated worldwide. The New York Times called The Beauty Myth one of the most significant books of the 21st century, of the 20th century. She has written opinion columns and essays for every major new <coughs> news outlet in the US and many globally. It made her, amongst other things, a feminist icon. She was an advisor to President Bill Clinton and to v Vice President Al Gore. She is also a professor, graduated from Yale and Oxford University, plus an honorable Rhodes Scholarship. Her latest book, Facing the Beast, is a detailed and a very personal witness account of the crazy changes in society during the lockdowns. Her unexpected political, personal, and spiritual transformation that followed, as well as a metaphysical quest on the nature of reality and her real and recent near-death experience. She said of herself she is a bad cook, but still <laughs> managed to get a video about mustard removed from X and YouTube, <laughs> and made a magical soup once that turned three killers and torturers into peaceful and caring humans. One of them became her husband. Tucker Carlson said about her, she is one of the clearest thinking people I know, and she's been a thrilling inspiration to me. An example to understand what bravery looks like. And I'm talking to Naomi Wolf. Thank you for being here. It's an honor to have you here. That is absolutely one of the nicest introductions I've ever had. Oh, Thank really? you so much. That's really, I'm very moved. I appreciate wow, that. Great. Well, you did it all by yourself. Thank it's you. a short summary of what I uh, know that's in the public domain mm -hmm. of your efforts. It is true. You got it right. Thank great. You. So it's great to have you here and um, to dive right in. What happened that 3,500 
scientists and medical people came to you to offer their support? Yeah, um, great question. So I will need to step a bit back in the timeline. Um, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a poetry defil. Um, I have no scientific training. Uh, as you mentioned, I've been well known since I was 26 years old as a nonfiction writer, um, specializing in women's issues usually and then moving on to civil liberties. Um, but in 2021, I was tweeting very factual information about women eyewitness reports of their own bodies having menstrual dysregulation and very serious menstrual symptoms upon receiving the mRNA COVID injections. And I was immediately deplatformed from Twitter, from Facebook, from YouTube, in a global smear campaign, which uh, I couldn't even understand at that time because I didn't understand the role of AI in journalism at that time. Mm -hmm. But it, it overnight changed my bio everywhere in the world from all these nice things you just mentioned to conspiracy theorists, like crazy conspiracy theorists. Mm -hmm. So I was silenced, but uh, and, and I was a non-person on the left. All my legacy media, the BBC, The Guardian, where I used to be a columnist, The Sunday Times of London, where I was a columnist, Project Syndicate, where I was a columnist, n I was erased, right, and, and smeared. And yes. it was upon a specific tweet? That specific tweet. That tweet. And that, that was also the tweet where the White House acted and, on And it turned out, per disclosure by my lawyers in this past year, that it was the White House is singling out that accurate tweet that would have been helpful to millions of women, protected their health, saved, no doubt, millions of babies, as we will discover. And they p were putting illegal, unconstitutional pressure on Twitter and Facebook to issue a BOLO, meaning be on the lookout, it's law enforcement language, against me and tweets like mine. Yeah. Um, so that... I, it was stunning, but the one person who still wanted to talk to me at a major platform was Steve Bannon. And as you noted in my bio, I come from the left. I advised President Clinton's re-election campaign, uh, not him personally, but his campaign. I advised Vice President Gore personally and his campaign. Um, and I've been seen as a, a, a left winger my whole life. And of course, Steve Bannon is a you know MAGA conservative. But I really credit him because he not only wanted to hear what I had to say, he continued to give me a platform during my critiques of the lockdowns, mm -hmm. which were unconstitutional. I mean, everything your audience already knows, yeah. you know, the, the masking, unconstitutional, the nonsense science, the, you know, unverifiable data, the PCR tests that, you know, were it, it de designed to give false positives, so on and so on. I wrote about all of this in my prequel to this, which is called uh, uh, The Bodies of Others. But at one point in 2022, there was a significant victory because a lawyer named Aaron Siri successfully sued the FDA, which is our U.S. Food and Drug Administration, yep. which is supposed to make sure our food and drugs are not contaminated, yep. are safe. And the result of that lawsuit was that the judge ordered the FDA, which is the custodian of the Pfizer papers, right, to release all of the internal documentation that led to the emergency use authorization, the rollout of a substance that was not finished with its clinical trials, mm -hmm. right, in 2020. And so we, as a journalist, I observed this release with concern because A, the documents were so voluminous, right? 450,000 documents, but some of the documents are thousands of pages long. So no journalist, as you know, can get through that. No. Even a newsroom can't get through that. No. And also they're written in very technical, scientific and medical language. Yeah. So uh, we needed specialists and it was Bannon's idea. He said, well, let's crowdsource this. You'll, put, you know, you'll oversee it, of course, and you'll, you know, make it happen and issue reports. And I'm like, okay, of course I will. So at that point, and this is where I would say, I don't want to get ahead of the story, but I would say we got divine help because I can't explain it any other way yeah. because I don't have those organizational skills. But this woman named Amy Kelly reached out to volunteer for us as a project manager, and she has unbelievable training in organizational management and this chaos of thousands of people coming to us saying, I want to volunteer. Here's my CV. I'm a distinguished scientist. I'm a distinguished physician. I 
was overwhelmed. And within minutes of our getting Amy Kelly on board, she, it was like, you know, parting the Red Sea. You know, she, she just organized this group of 3,250 doctors wow. and scientists and biostatisticians and medical fraud investigators and uh, lab clinicians and research scientists, you know, every cardiologist, oncologist, pathologists, uh, radiologists, uh, every, every specialty we could possibly require yeah. came to us highly credentialed and she organized them to produce into six teams uh, with a leader for each team and they've produced now 96 reports since your ah. last update mm -hmm. you can see them all for free europe on dailycloud.io you can order them in book format both from us and there's a second volume coming out next month called the pfizer papers but i guess that that was historic and it changed the discussion. And also these 250 lawyers who helped us sue Pfizer, sue the Justice Department, or write a letter to the Justice Department, uh, sue the Biden administration, sue the FDA. Um, and so apparently there was enough to do that. Oh my God. It, and I should, I should get to the end, the, the reports that our team has, has written and I taught them to write in English that everyone could understand, That's right? Great. Oof, it's yeah. not an easy task, no. but they did it. And Amy Kelly edited it. Um, these reports document the greatest crime against humanity in recorded history. And it was an intentional crime. And I can give you my evidence if you like. Yeah, I'd like to. And you also state that it was, uh, you discovered Mengele type experiments. Could you yeah, tell us a little bit about what you find uh, in those papers? Because it was incredible. Maybe a few highlights that you your expert team uh, found sure um so sad and i just want to preface this by saying i can't go into detail but literally the day after the book containing this information was published for the first time in a european language in a european country and for the first time i came to europe since the lockdowns and started having interviews about what's in the Pfizer papers, mm -hmm. my company is getting restricted and hammered and suspended and threatened from multiple angles. So I just want to put that out there. I won't go into detail, but no. it literally happened the day after the first interviews. From the minute we've arrived and the first interviews went out, there have been um, substantial problems that have been sent our way. Yeah. and. And it's just really interesting timing, whether it's all a coincidence or not, because the the word is out in the United States, right? Yeah. It doesn't do Hillsdale, any... Hillsdale, you did. Totally. A million views. Yeah, exactly. And and mm -hmm. Bannon has a million followers. He's, I think he's the third most popular political podcaster, the second. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is, as a strategist, this kind of makes sense, even if it's all a coincidence, because in America we've driven down the uptake of the booster to four percent so we were successful we saved millions of lives and we drove down pfizer's uh global uh, revenue to before 2016 levels so we popped their economic bubble it was 90 percent or something yeah, yeah. oh it hugely inflated yeah. and the word is out it is 60 percent of americans think they know someone who died of a vaccine injury so the mainstream people know by now what we've been trying so hard for two years to tell yeah, them so there's no it. well right but there's no but but the point is the knowledge has escaped in yeah. the united states in the netherlands i'm finding there's a lot of rumor and uh wariness and concern about what's in the vaccines but the details haven't been broken out you know in the way that we break them out yeah. so um it's just so interesting strategically once the word is out of there it doesn't make sense to throw resources at crushing someone you know or preventing them from speaking because the horse is out of the barn yeah. but it's very interesting that this is such a vulnerable moment in europe that i'm just getting the word out and all these obstacles are coming our way yeah. Point being, we have to publicize this as quickly as possible yeah, yeah. so that uh, so that um, we can move on. Yeah, they can move on to other in, targets. Uh, right? Also, like uh, it becomes clear now that uh, political opponents of the Biden administrations in the last three and a half years are being thrown in prison. Oh my God! And a lot of people. So, th 
Do, do you have any fears that they will come to you with something like that? Well, I was well known from a very early age. And so from a very early age, and then I was a political consultant. Mm -hmm. So from a very early age, I understood that the only way to survive doing what I knew I had to do, I didn't know how serious it would be till 2020, but I knew that the only way to survive long term was to live my life in a very squeaky clean way. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't believe unless there's a complete breakdown of the rule of law, that in the United States, I can be detained or arrested because I have not committed any crimes or anything that even has the appearance of impropriety, right? Yeah. And I'm not saying Trump has, I'm just saying he's a bigger target, yeah. right? Because he has a more complex financial life. Um, but in Europe, I'm pretty scared because there aren't the same protections. Uh, so I brought my husband with me and uh -huh. he is, uh, I met him as my bodyguard when I was first getting death threats. So I'm sure I'll be fine and it'll be fine, but it is a more um, vulnerable uh, place to be than the United States right now for someone like me. Yeah. So in the Pfizer documents, our team, and this is not their opinion, it's not interpretation, they link with every statement to the primary document, right? Yeah. So you can just click through and see Pfizer's own internal documents. Yeah. And by the way, remember the FDA asked the court to keep these documents hidden until we were all dead. And the, these documents, they never thought they'd see the light of day, right? Yeah. So they're really written, they're like Mengele's notebooks. Um, so the Pfizer documents show that a month after the rollout of the vaccine in the US, which was November of 2020, and these are global documents, right? Uh, but in the US, it was rolled out 2020, and a month later, Pfizer concluded that the vaccines did not stop COVID and were ineffective to stop COVID. Yeah. The third most common side effect in the documents is COVID. And um, in fact, Pfizer's language is vaccine failure and failure of efficacy. That's their words, yeah. one month after rollout. So everything that followed, the lockdowns, the kids out of school, the masking, the mandates, the forced injections, don't kill grandma. They knew it was all a lie. Yeah. And and in Europe, or I should say in the Netherlands, I'm being asked a lot in such an interesting place. We're in somewhat different places in our journeys because I've been living with this knowledge for like a year and a half and and people are just processing it now, mm -hmm. understandably, because uh, they didn't have all the information. But the, the most uh, disorienting thing, I think, to some people in the Netherlands is, did they know? Was this like intentional or could this have been intentional? And when you start with that piece of evidence that they knew from November and these documents went to the FDA and they went to the European medical uh, authorities and they went to your public health authorities, right? Or the summaries went to all of these authorities. Yeah. They knew, they couldn't have not known. No. They knew and they knew that it wasn't even tested for transmission. So the whole you still see them in the Netherlands. You still see them in the United States, these little stickers saying, stand here, stand here, yeah. don't get too close. They knew it was a lie yeah. from the start. All right. By April of 2021, Pfizer knew and the FDA knew and our lawyers have actually FOIA'd, which is a Freedom of Information Act request, internal documents. So the White House knew and they were freaking out contacting the CDC, Dr. Fauci, Rochelle Walensky, the top people yeah. for an emergency internal communications meeting to cover this up in April of 2021. But they knew that the injections were causing heart damage to minors. Yeah. And rather, and the Israeli Ministry of Health warned them and a pediatrician's association warned them. Rather than calling a press conference, telling parents in America and around the world, stop, this raises the risk of heart damage in minors. Mm -hmm. They doubled down. They created a script, which is a 17 page completely redacted script to lie to us, saying that it, myocarditis occasionally emerged, but it was mild and transient and rare. You remember those words? Mm -hmm. Again, AI, those words appeared around the world. When every time you saw myocarditis, you saw rare and mild, right? Mm -hmm. And that, and they then mm -hmm. ran a huge propaganda campaign that summer with influencers on TikTok to get minors and young adults injected. Good morning, let's go get vaccinated.
Okay guys, I'm officially halfway vaccinated. I got the cool card that they give you. Um, it was really like a positive and uplifting experience and everyone was super nice. And I'll let you guys know when I get my second dose, but I highly recommend. Yeah. And that was the era, and I will, as the mother of people that age, I'll never, for, and stepmother, I'll never forgive them for this because they knew it was causing heart damage in young adults. They knew young adults were not at risk from COVID. They knew the injections didn't stop COVID. And that was the summer in America, I don't know about Europe, where college students were mandated to get the injection if they wanted to come back to school. They knew um, that, so this is, they knew, okay, there are 40, almost 43,000 adverse events in three months in the Pfizer documents. These are industrial scale serious adverse events, including 1,225 fatalities, deaths. Pfizer hid eight deaths of vaccinated people and didn't report them in the way that they were uh, obligated to legally timely. Mm -hmm. They held back till after the EUA was granted in order to claim that the vaccinated group had fewer deaths than the unvaccinated. Mm -hmm. Remember all that propaganda. It'll keep you out of the, it'll keep you from serious illness and death. Okay, yes, there may be side effects, but it'll keep you from serious illness and death. That was based on them hiding the bodies of eight vaccinated people who died. And they also only got to that 95% effective. Remember that? 98, Borla, oh, it's 99% effective. It's 95% effective. Uh, you, right? Yeah. Right, exactly. Right, they got to that initial 95% effective by removing 200 vaccinated infected people from their math. Yeah. Otherwise, it would have had negative efficacy, meaning you'd be worse off, which yeah. is what we see. Which is true. Which is what we see. Yeah. So lies upon lies. And these are not hidden um, mistakes, right? These are right there. Like our analysts are like, well, look at that. They got to that math by just not counting these 200 sick vaccinated people. Look at that. They hid, I mean, this bombshell about these eight bodies that they hid to get to the, you're safe or you're not going to die from the injection. That's like such a criminal act. We're, you know, filing criminal charges. I mean, that's unbelievable. Yeah. And, that's and murder. Also that, um, and from what I understand is that it's um, many secret things happen very compartmentalized that a lot of people are, good people are working on it, not knowing what they actually do. But this sounds like you cannot not know. You can't not know. No. You cannot so not know. The amount of people that right. was in on consciously it. working on this right. while knowing it's actually a killing machine yeah. is unbelievable. It, unbelievable. And I mean, literally, you can open the Pfizer documents anywhere and stick a pin in the page and you're probably gonna hit a crime that is right there in your face. Yeah. Let me go on to the headlines, uh, just so that I will have known that I've sh shared it with you and done my job. Um, so I mentioned there are almost 42,000 adverse events, including these 1,225 deaths. Uh, the, w when you go to the CDC website or probably the European, you know, America, uh, what is it, the EMU, the European Medical, yeah. authorities yeah. It's a website public health website you probably have the same side effects that we do which is you know chills maybe a fever maybe soreness at the site yeah. in fact they knew that there were catastrophic side effects at industrial scale which is what we're seeing now they knew that in addition to the deaths there would be a uh, number one side effect is myalgia or muscle pain and this is so interesting because people don't feel good now. A lot of people just don't feel good. They feel bad and they don't know why. Yeah. Pfizer knows why. It's myalgia. Uh, number two is joint pain. I see so many people, hip replacement, knee replacement, limping, arthritis, uh, shoulder replacement, young people, healthy people. That's the inflammation from the injection. Third most common side effect, as I mentioned, is COVID. But then at industrial... I thousands, tens of thousands, stroke, heart attack, pericarditis, myocarditis, blood clots, lung clots, ranges of florid neurological events, um, dementias, Alzheimer's, brain damage of all kinds, uh, uh, encephalitis, um, uh, epilepsy type uh, problems, Guillain-Barre, um, catastrophic clotting issues, catastrophic circulatory issues, respiratory 
crises, horrible skin problems like hives and lesions and, you know, horrible inflammatory problems on the skin. Um, and all, all of this and liver damage, kidney damage, half the liver damage was within 48 hours after the injection. Um, half of the uh, strokes were within 48 hours after the injection. So they knew that the they would, were creating what we now see, and it breaks my heart every day because all around me, I hear vaccine injuries and people are not being told that they're vaccine injuries. Oh, you know, three heart attacks, two strokes, micro strokes in a healthy young woman giving birth for the first time. You know, um, people are having dementias and Alzheimer's and cancers. They, there's, there's likely something called SV40, which is a, a carcinogen in the Moderna, at least. I don't know about the mm -hmm. Pfizer, but turbo cancers, um, you know, horrible skin conditions. I mean, loved ones of mine have vaccine injuries. My mom has tachycardia from her third boost booster. And it's like, mom, don't get your booster. You, th There will be tachycardia, you know, like she got tachycardia and nobody, it's omerta. No one will tell these patients, this is a vaccine injury. And now let's treat it like a vaccine injury. They can't because the money flow, and this is a bit of a detour, but it's directly related, millions and millions of dollars were handed to the American Cancer Association, the American Medical Association, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, probably every one of your professional uh, medical organizations. Mm -hmm. But the contract was written, and Dr. Jim Thorpe, a fetal maternal medicine specialist, and his wife, a lawyer, foiled this and found this. The contracts with these guys were written in such a way that if any of the doctors told the truth, they'd have to give back the money. So doctors who tell the truth are being delicensed. They're being visibly delicensed for just warning their patients, giving them informed consent. But if you deviate from the CDC script, which is safe and effective, no side effects, maybe a fever, you get you get delicensed and the professional organization cracks down because they have to give the money back. So that's how they did it. Um, it. So those are some of the side effects. Now, apart from that, to me, the most dramatic thing, they said that the material stay in the injection site. And I remember, I'll never forget this conversation. I have relatives, God bless them, who are high level scientists and doctors. And early on, they were trying to get me to stop asking questions, like out of love for me, no doubt. But yeah. they were on a call with me. And I said, where does the spike protein go? And they started guessing. Mm -hmm. You know, they're like, well, of course, it's digested and excreted. And they were just, you know, of course, it's filtered through the liver, you know. And they were just guessing because no one knew at that point where the mm -hmm. spike protein went. So I made it a mission to find out where the spike protein went. But you can't find out until you look at the Pfizer documents. So instead of staying in the deltoid or being digested and excreted, you know, we were told it leaves the body, right? It leaves the body, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, not true. It's as Dr. Robert Chandler, who's one of our leaders, he was a very distinguished sports medicine physician who treated the Angels and the Lakers and other important sports teams. He did an important study report that shows that within 48 hours, the lipid nanoparticles, which are these industrial fats that encase the mRNA, you can order them online, they're made in China, of course, the polyethylene glycol, which coats the lipid nanoparticles, it's a petroleum derivative, it's in antifreeze, and the mRNA itself and the spike protein, they don't stay in the deltoid, they biodistribute throughout the body and accumulate in certain organs. And our volunteers could not find any mechanism whereby these materials left the body. So it looks like first injection, they accumulate. Second injection, more accumulate. Third injection, more accumulate. And a study out of China, interestingly, in 2021, confirmed this. It's in my essay, Facing the Beast. It's in this book. Mm -hmm. China commissioned it, and that's when I thought, oh, this is a murder weapon, you know? Yeah, that's actually the heart of facing the beast, uh, that is the CCP. Correct, exactly. So they found that with the first injection, a mouse's system 
is damaged to some extent. The second injection is catastrophic, visible white patches on the heart. You know, the heart enlarges. Uh, so, you know, mice are not humans, but that's what you see in the body, in the charts, in the Pfizer documents, is the, the amount in the deltoid over time goes like this, and the amount in the other organs goes like this over time. And they cut off the study in two weeks, so you really can't see, you know, where it goes over time, right? But um, where does it accumulate? In the ovaries. So again, I'm talking about industrial fats, right? So the first injection packs into the ovaries and into the fallopian tubes. And what nurses are saying they're seeing in abdominal surgery now for vaccinated women, even if they're not looking for this, is blocked ovaries from this material. Um, and so that could be a trigger for some of the menstrual damage and the horrible passing of tissue and, you know, material women had never seen before, you know, coming out of their bodies, right? Um, it also accumulates in the liver, the adrenals, the lymphatic system, and the spleen, and it crosses the blood-brain barrier, right? This material has been known for 10 years to cross every, every membrane in the human body. Yeah. Uh, and it's been known for 10 years to cause reproductive damage. So what is it doing in this injection? They knew it would cause reproductive damage. Yeah. That's, so it's not a bug, it's a feature, yeah. right? So it also, you know, what else is a membrane? The placenta is a membrane. So it crosses the placenta and causes calcifications and weakness in the placenta when there's a baby in utero. That's why we're seeing some brave midwives and Dr. Thorpe himself independently confirmed that we're seeing flattened placentas, small placentas, they can't grow to size, babies are being delivered premature. And let me ask you, really pregnant women used to be really big. Yeah. When have you seen since 2020 a really pregnant woman? You see slightly, you know, you see small bumps, but you don't see the big bumps anymore. And that's anecdotal. But women are being delivered early because their placentas can't grow. The babies are born prematurely and um, and they're born with often uh, damage in the respiratory, in the lungs. Pfizer knew that, it's in the Pfizer documents. And, and fetal, I'm sorry, maternal deaths are up 40% because now women are giving birth in 19th century circumstances where they can bleed to death because the placenta doesn't all come out, the placenta ruptures, there's hemorrhaging. So what else is a membrane around the testes? There's a membrane. So baby boys in utero, uh, and actually Amy Kelly found this, um, that the lipid nanoparticles get into the amniotic fluid, they get into the baby in utero, and then they get into the, um, the amniotic, I'm sorry, the membrane around the testes. And so they degrade what are called the Sertoli cells and the Leydig cells, which are, which regulate male um, masculinity. Mm -hmm. And so those are the cells that turn on uh, testosterone when boys reach adolescence and turn into adult men. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? They, that allows for secondary male sex characteristics, facial hair, deep voices, broad shoulders, all the things we think of as masculine, yeah. and the ability to father children. Mm -hmm. So we don't know. These baby boys in utero, we don't know, even if they've never been injected, if their moms were injected, what, you know, well, or maybe before if they got pregnant, um, it's possible that they will not develop normal uh, adult male characteristics. Yeah. Uh, we know that the lipid nanoparticles and the spike protein has a negative effect on sperm and uh, sperm motility and sperm health. That was in Andrology, a journal called Andrology. So what you see in the Pfizer documents, and in the Pfizer documents, there's a, a section where there's over 80% miscarriage or spontaneous abortion of the pregnancies. And in another section, there's an eight page pregnancy and lactation report, and it shows two babies died in utero. And according to Pfizer, the cause of death was maternal exposure to the vaccine. The cause of death of those babies, according to Pfizer, was maternal exposure to the vaccine. In that report, there's also a big uh, chart. They make these Mengele type charts showing how sick babies were getting from nursing vaccinated moms because the mRNA, the spike protein, the lipid nanoparticles affect the breast milk or, you know, poison the breast milk. So, but no one told nursing moms that. 
So these babies are having convulsions, they have fevers, they're disconsolate, they have failure to thrive, they're having edema, which is the swelling of their tissues. One poor baby was hospitalized and died with multi-organ system failure. Uh, charts of sick babies, charts of sick babies. And this, this summary, pregnancy and lactation report, showing this catastrophic effect on mothers and babies was sent to on April 20th, 2021 20, to Rochelle Walensky, to Rochelle Walensky. Uh, she had it in hand on three days later, April 23rd, 2021, when she gave a press release from the White House to all the women of America and said, the vaccine is safe and effective in pregnancy. There is no bad time to get your mRNA COVID shot before your pregnancy, during your pregnancy, or after your baby is born. And she had this document that said they will get sick, they will die, they will spontaneously abort. Pregnant people experience the same side effects as others following vaccination. We were also able to follow in detail more than 3,900 pregnant women and over 800 of whom have completed their pregnancies. Importantly, no safety concerns were observed for people vaccinated in the third trimester uh, um, or safety concerns for their babies. As such, CDC recommends that pregnant people receive the COVID-19 vaccine. COVID is supposed to be a respiratory disease, right? Mm -hmm. There's virtually nothing that I've seen, very little, except as symptoms of the vaccine. Um, looking at the lungs or the mucous membranes or breathing. V virtually the centerpiece of the Pfizer documents is reproductive. Mm -hmm. It's aimed at male and female reproduction to damage it and destroy it. And they have weird stuff in there like they tell vaccinated men in no uncertain terms not to have intercourse with women of childbearing age who are unvaccinated um, and if they do, to use two reliable forms of contraception too, at, at once, right? Like don't, don't, like there's something in the semen of vaccinated men, it appears that, I mean, I don't mean to freak people out, but they need to know this, mm. that, um, that is dangerous either to women or to fetuses. It's unclear, but they don't want there to be a conception. <clears throat> and um, they also mated rats together, male vaccinated and female unvaccinated rats, then they sacrificed them. Then instead of looking at their lungs, they looked at their sex organs and they looked at the cells of their sex, of their sex organs. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this incredible focus, you know, as I mentioned, there, these charts, there's a chart of like, I got deplatformed for warning about menstrual symptoms because doesn't take, you don't have to be a scientist. If there are menstrual symptoms in 2021, there are going to be fertility problems in 2024, which is exactly what we're seeing. Uh, Igor Chudov looked at government databases. He's a mathematician and found, especially in Western Europe and North America, drops of 13 to 20% in live births in the last year or two. There are a million missing babies, he's concluded, in Western Europe, a drop in the birth rate, right? And the Pfizer documents, adverse events are disproportionately in North America, then in Western Europe, in order of political importance, all the rest of the world, only 7,000 adverse events. So they're tar it's targeted at these populations. And I can explain how easy it is to target if you like. But the, the um, charts in the Pfizer documents show that they tracked how much damage they were doing to women, women's sexual health and reproductive health. 15,000 women have two periods a month. 10,000 women have no periods, meaning they'll never have a baby. Uh, you know, 7,500 women um, bleed every day of their lives, meaning their lives are over, they're disabled, right? Uh, you know, 5,000 women um, pass are hemorrhaging, you know, pass tissue. I mean, the, you know, this many, uh, you know, have horribly painful uh, menstruation. And this is all since the injection, right? So they knew what they were doing to women. 62% of the adverse events are in women. Of these, Pfizer says, of these, Pfizer calls 16% of those reproductive disorders. 
So they knew they were creating a bioweapon. They knew it would kill people. They knew it would disable people. And oh, especially they knew that it would reduce the population. It's incredible. Now I can see uh, why you compare them to uh, mingle the type experiments. Yeah. And I just want to note for the record, I'm Jewish. And my grandmother lost nine brothers and sisters in the Holocaust. So I really don't. I don't make those comparisons rhetorically. I'm literally saying this is Mengele science. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, and what has been, uh, it's incredible what you found. And uh, what has been the response uh, since you put it out? Because this is like, this should be everywhere on the should news. Be everywhere. It should be everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, thank God. Uh, there is a robust, independent media and podcaster ecosystem in the United States. Mm -hmm. So half the country heard what we were saying yeah. through these independent channels. Half the country has no idea still because yeah. they're watching NPR and uh, or listening to NPR, watching CNN. And those outlets are funded by pharma and yeah. by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who... Yeah you know, funneled millions of dollars before lockdowns to BBC, Guardian, New York Times for overcoming vaccine hesitancy. So those mainstream media has continued to vilify me. Um, you know, an important intellectual, Naomi Klein, whose household derives income from the pharma industry, I found out that both her husband is a spokesmodel for big pharma and her father-in-law sits on boards that receive millions of dollars for vaccines from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, but she wrote a whole book trying to destroy my reputation. Uh, so legacy media is still attacking us or ignoring us. Yeah. No one has covered the Pfizer documents in legacy media, zero, um, except to call us crazy conspiracy theorists. They can't because if they look at it, they'd have to see that it's primary source documentation and journalism at the highest levels written by the most credentialed people. Yeah. And independent media has widely covered us. And so I have a bigger audience in America than I had before I was pla deplatformed, but it's, it's in the other America, yeah. right? Now, globally, very interesting, Bannon's show does have viewers around the world and daily cloud has viewers and consumers around the world however um look at look at my visit to the netherlands you know the last two times i came to the netherlands uh i was it's so funny i was my work on feminism was covered in all the major news out, you know, newspapers, all the major TV shows. Uh, you know, I was lionized. It was wonderful. I loved being famous in the Netherlands, you know, yeah. right? It was fun. Yeah. Um, and this time around, as I understand from my publisher, it's only independent and dissident news outlets who will talk to me uh -huh. and all of the major news outlets that should be covering. It's not about me, this news about what has been put in the bodies, you know, possibly of, yeah. I don't know, 60 or 70 percent of Dutch people, there's no media coverage to my knowledge. But as someone who has spent my whole career in legacy media yeah. in all of Western Europe and Australia and New Zealand and the United States, this is bullshit. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm sorry to use bad language and you can beep it out, but, the, you know, all these journalists, they have no excuse. All these editors, all these publishers, it's fine if you don't want to cover my personal work, but to not cover the biggest story, the biggest public interest story in our century That's you know cool. it's it's I unbelievable that I, I did a little bit of research on what, what, it, what could possibly be in the legacy media and here in the netherlands we have the nos is a, a big one uh it's all paid by public funds as well and um, yeah. There was one journalist who covered this and he said, well, it's just some crazy conspiracy uh, guys who are on social media and they cannot read uh, these reports because they are very difficult to read. And uh, they extracted some, and well, because not everybody is smart and, and doing the right thing. So they, they picked three very bad examples and said uh, nothing to see here please move on and examples the, from from our volunteers work no that was about the uh, the pfizer papers uh -huh. uh, he did a nine minute piece on the pfizer papers and then uh, yeah, on national television 
and that uh, uh, well, there's some rumors on social media that the Pfizer papers that there, and that there are terrible things and stuff. But we've investigated. Oh my god! Oh my god! And uh, well, what we found is bullshit. Well, so. they didn't call us. You know, no, they I didn't. Know, they I didn't know, look at our records. Terrible. Hier zit geen luchtje aan. Dus alle ophef over de effectiviteit. De bijwerkingen en overlijdens blijken gebaseerd op verkeerde verbanden en soms gebakken lucht. It's, and I just want to stress, every single report is pinned for free on Daily Cloud. They could have googled, the yeah. Pfizer papers comes right up. Yeah. They could have, no, you know, they checked it out. To. They don't want that's, to. They don't want to. They're, look, public funding of media turns out to be the most dangerous thing because why would they now investigate their own crime? And yeah. and then what happened in the lockdowns, I'm sure in the Netherlands, happened throughout, no doubt, Western Europe, certainly happened in North America. All these even non-government news outlets took the money, right? There was money for overcoming vaccine hesitancy from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or from the government sometimes. Yeah, and, and also to universities. Yeah, and to universities, I, I go into that. Right. Yeah, they bought up every important institution that could bring us the truth about this. Yeah. So to people uh, who were calling for amnesty when it was clear that severe crimes were committed in the and coming out of the Pfizer papers, you said uh, there was no group hack after the liberation of Auschwitz, right. and um, and you call for accountability. Right. And uh, how do you see that happen? How? Yeah, I mean. So there are many ways accountability happens when people have committed crimes against humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, but in my, so in my country, you know, a daily clout, my news site was founded to give people more um, hands on ability to change laws, to yeah. pass legislation and see what the laws are, what the bills are. Um, so one of the things that has concerned me a lot, I promise I'll answer your question, is and I wrote about it in the prequel, The Bodies of Others, and I wrote about it also in Facing the Beast, is the fact that the EU structure, and you know this better than I, has drained sovereignty of Europe's sovereign nations, such that people can't easily know what to do when a lot of government officials have committed crimes like this, right? It's not that clear what your recourse is. Um, not too many people, but to say a little bit about sure. this, that is uh, the... United Nations of Europe, as they were first called, uh, was uh, ERA, the ERISE was founded in um, 1957 mm -hmm. by Walter Heistein, Halstein. He became president mm -hmm. and he was a convicted war criminal in the Nuremberg trial. And there are more convicted war criminals who were the founding fathers of the EU. And you can find this in, it's easy to find. Also, Karl Wuster, he was the inventor of the Zyklon B gas that Jews mm -hmm. uh, were killed with. And um, we had a um, you say referendum mm -hmm. for the EU constitution in the Netherlands mm -hmm. and also for other countries. And all the uh, people chose no, we don't want it. But then they changed the name of the constitution to the Lisbon Treaty. And they changed the um, how do you say full harder the uh, the paragraphs around a bit, uh, and then and they called it the Lisbon Treaty, and they ratified it without any oh consultation of the of, of anyone oh my in god. Europe. Oh my god! Four hundred fifty million people. Oh my god! And we have uh, one uh, person, uh, Wim Voermans. He is uh, uh, a professor in has a degree in uh, in politics and, and knows very well these sort of things and he's also a lot of mainstream television and he said right out it's a scam and it's uh, a coup mm. and they succeeded yeah things looked very grim uh, the outlook was very grim and yeah. these member states where the referendum had gone uh, the wrong way for the european constitution could not of course uh, uh, say listen too bad but we're going to rectify it anyway and then the commission said let, let, let's stop the process we need to come up with something different and yes they came up with something completely different the Lisbon Treaty but how different was this Lisbon Treaty it is the constitutional treaty in a different wrapping you and me didn't want more Europe and we denied the Constitution so this time we were not asked about our opinion We've been deceived. We've yeah. been fooled. 
absolutely. And obviously, uh, the, the government and the, the parties supporting the Lisbon Treaty were afraid of voters, the voters saying no again. The Prime Minister said, well, if, if Holland votes no, then I will look like a fool in Europe. Was that fair to the people that said no? No. It wasn't? No. No? No. It's a scam. Yeah? Yes. So, it is illegitimate right. and it is founded by uh, convicted war criminals. Wow, that, that is really important information. I mean, we are siloed by these algorithms. So, there's information you have that I need that we don't get yeah. online. And there's information I hope I have that you all can use. Uh, that's that, there, that's right? really, but that's really important. We have this rede ausgegraben. Und haben Sie in dem Buch die Nazi-Wurzeln der Brüsseler EU dokumentiert. Warum dieser Titel? Weil eben jener Hallstein, der 1939 den Plan für die eroberten Länder entworfen hat, 18 Jahre später zu was ernannt wurde? Zum Gründungspräsidenten der Brüsseler EU. Zehn Jahre lang war er der Chefarchitekt dieses Konstrukts. Herr Hallstein, wenn der den Vertrag von Lissabon gelesen hätte, da hätte er alles wiedergefunden, nur einen Satz nicht oder ein Gesetz nicht. Das Gesetz über Blut und Ehre, das war nicht mehr da. Passte nicht mehr in die Zeit. Alles andere finden Sie da drin. I have many examples now of bad behavior around referenda um, and, and no recourse. Like we were following Scotland in, I think also 2014 or 2017, I don't remember, uh, for their referendum to leave Britain, right? They wanted sovereignty. And it was the majority of people were voting yes to leave Britain to make their own sovereign laws. Uh, and people were contacting us. We have 400 sworn affidavits, time, place, you know, what happened of people saying we're getting blank ballots. They are not being counted. And uh, people were finding, you know, sacks of ballots that were discarded. Right. And, yeah. and these were all in yes precincts. Mm -hmm. And I pushed it and I. I tried to find out, well, what's the recourse? Who's responsible if that happens? I called, you know, the, the election council, which their bosses are Britain, by the way, the people from whom Scotland was trying to succeed, right? Yeah. So the people who followed, who, who are responsible for election integrity referred me to the precinct. The precinct referred me to um, the council. The council referred me to the electoral council. So it was a complete circle with no recourse. And so basically the people of, of Scotland voted to leave Britain yeah. and didn't get to leave. No. And I think, excuse me, I'm sorry to bring this up, but to bring it back to the Netherlands, I was told by someone highly knowledgeable yesterday that you all voted in a certain leadership, but they're waiting to be seated. Is that correct? Yeah. So don't hold your breath. No, no. I mean, it sounds to me like they're trying to find a way to demonstrate. I see a lot of theater showing the people of Europe, just like the people of the United States, that their vote doesn't count anymore, yeah. that anything can be done and they're helpless. So let me go back to your question. I don't mean to depress you, but I am trying to like wake people up. Like yeah. this is what time it is. This is a coup. It is no longer time to keep waiting for these guys to do the right thing. They're not going to do the right thing. They're trying to murder us and take our liberty um, and make our kids slaves and track us. I mean, the, it's rolling out so fast in Europe, the central bank digital currency. And the I saw people going through biometrics at Ski, Skifo Airport. Yeah. Facial recognition. Yeah. Ha! Huh. Well, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. But you know what? It's voluntary at this point still legally. You don't have to do it. No, that's true. That's true. But the government could have made a decision to um, make this software and these cameras, uh, how do you call it, um, that they would not be allowed in in, in our country. But right. they said, that, that, yeah, 
they didn't do it, so no. they're allowed. Yes. So all kinds of government branches and companies are using it. Totally. Yeah. Well, so I will tell you, they're selling that data to third parties. Yeah, uh, definitely. But I guess what I'm trying to say is back to the status of Europeans and the status of the Dutch. Because this was done so stealthily, right? And they were brilliant. 60 years, what's the EU up to or what became the EU? Free museums, free concerts, you know, like parks, environmental protections, human rights. Everyone got lulled into sleep, you know, no war. You can go vacation in Portugal without showing your passport. It, it's, it was so seductive. Yeah. But what I was aware of starting when I started asking people in Europe, do you know how to lobby to pass a law? Whom do you pressure to stop a law? Nobody knew. And this was including um, journalists and editors. And then I found out the structure of the EU and I told a, a, a highly placed journalist at the Sunday Times of London, you know, the EU is not a meta-democracy. It's, there's no way you can lobby for the bills. You can't even see the bills. Wow. I tried to find the database. I had the PR people of the EU like hounding me on social media, but I'm like, I can't see your database. What bills are coming out? I can't find it. You know, wow. it doesn't exist. Wow. And, and she was astonished, and, but she was scared to report on it, right? So brilliant coup, yeah. stealthy, silent coup. Well, the, the, the convicted war criminal, uh, Walter Hallstein, he was installed as uh, president of the United States of Europe with 10,000 bureaucrats. Wow. That was the start. Oh, my God. Yeah. So that's what they just had years to prepare all right, this. Right, they did. And, the, uh, and it's very cleverly done because most mainstream people, uh, journalists and even most mainstream uh, people uh, uh, yeah, don't know about it. No, it's brilliant. And yeah. instead of saying you were making laws without your voice or your representative's voice having any impact at all yeah. what they say is bureaucracy and red tape and then people think it's too confusing and i tried to follow the structure of the eu for, on the eu's website it's impossible yeah. to follow they created this complete smoke screen uh, we can do a whole thing on this right. i mean the eu is so incredible they have 116,000 laws and that was about 10 years ago and they one of the law is that every european has to know the law and if you don't, then you're uh, a criminal. What? And then you can also go to jail. Oh my God! So they effectively uh, have made everybody a criminal. Well, you're yeah. you're really. I see what you're doing. I see what they did. So one of the Dutch interviewers said something profound yesterday. He said, "So are you saying that the Nazis never? We never really conquered Nazism. They just kind of went underground and are resurfacing again." And I said, "That's exactly right." Yeah. And what you've just given me is a big piece of that puzzle. That's yeah. exactly right. So you're not going to uh, get amnesty. You're not going to get accountability from the criminals, right? No. And there's lots more openly as well, also to the U.S. I mean, and uh, if you dive into uh, uh, the, um, I can't remember the name, but um, Operation Paperclip, and then 1,500 Nazi scientists, uh, also the camp doctors. They flew to the U.S. Right. and they were lecturing the CIA right. on mind control experiments. Oh wow! And uh, uh, so that's incredible. Yeah. Nearly 1,500 German scientists, including war criminals, are expatriated to America. They are offered a new life in exchange for their knowledge and cooperation. Um, Operation Paperclip was a classified military program. It had a public face. So the idea was that you couldn't very well have 1,600 Germans running around the United States in various military facilities or uh, ultimately in academic institutions and not have an explanation why. And so with the German scientists came a, a propaganda campaign to call them good scientists. I found a protocol, for example, of uh, two uh, former Nazi party members who had been concentration camp uh, experimenters who came to Fort Detrick to give a lecture on sarin, the toxic poison gas. And uh, 
they explained the how all the ways that uh, it can be used and what kinds of dosages you need. And I was struck by one line in the protocol. It says, uh, we discovered that the age of the victim uh, does not change the amount of sarin that you need to achieve the fatal result. So you can just imagine what experiments they would have had to conduct in order to come up with conclusions like that. And these were lectures that were delivered to the CIA chemists and their co-workers uh, at Fort Detrick. What people also don't um, realize is what actually happens in the camps. And, you know, and they, and they work for labor and they went to death with gas and it was all terrible. And, but uh, what fa factually happens also, what came a little bit out of the Nuremberg trials uh, was that it wasn't the SS that was uh, really in charge. It were uh, doctors and scientists of companies, of Bus F, of all the chemical companies. And they were actually uh, involved in very sophisticated mind control experiments in which, uh, in what I have learned, that they were, um, they actually learned to capture what it is that uh, we stem our identity from. <gasps> and uh, they, can, they could extract it and they could also put it into other people. And that the what? gas chambers were a kind of experiment in which they could all bring people together in a certain frequency and they do, could do these kinds of experiments so that multiple people were walking around with the same personality no. and how they could do that. And that's what they've been fine tuning in MKUltra, oh my in, God. Uh, in Delta, in Labyrinth. And uh, th so that is, and that's what went on with Project Paperclip to uh, the US. <gasps> Gottlieb began by asking himself, what existing research is there out there? Who has already conducted intense experiments aimed at destroying human minds and souls and bodies? Well, the obvious answer was the Nazi doctors who had worked in the concentration camps and their Japanese counterparts who had conducted experiments that were actually even more grotesque than the ones that went on in the Nazi camps. So uh, MK Ultra wound up recruiting a number of Nazi doctors and their Japanese counterparts to come in and advise them on what they had learned in their experiments in concentration camps. So um, they had, for example, carried out very extensive experiments with mescaline on uh, prisoners at the Dachau concentration camp. So some of these doctors worked with um, American CIA teams in Europe or in East Asia, and Gottlieb traveled to both of those places regularly to uh, oversee those experiments. Others came to the United States and actually came to work at uh, Fort Detrick in Maryland, where Gottlieb had his scientific base. Outside the United States, Gottlieb's experiments were even more intense, because there he didn't have what they charmingly described as the disposal problem. Um, you, these experiments were carried out mostly in Germany, although also in some other European countries. And of course, Germany was a place that the US thoroughly dominated after World War II. Others were carried out in Japan and uh, the Philippines and uh, South Korea. One of your presidents apologized. I think it was Bill Clinton. And I'm not sure anymore, but they apologized for the MKUltra uh, uh, experiments uh, uh, on innocent, not knowing people. Thousands of government sponsored experiments did take place at hospitals, universities, and military bases around our nation. In too many cases, informed consent was withheld. Americans were kept in the dark about the effects of what was being done to them. The deception extended beyond the test subjects themselves to encompass their families and the American people as a whole. For these experiments were kept secret. And they were shrouded not for a compelling reason of national security, but for the simple fear of embarrassment. And that was wrong. So today, on behalf of another generation of American leaders and another generation of American citizens, the United States of America 
offers a sincere apology to those of our citizens who were subjected to these experiments, to their families, and to their communities. And one of the people who were who was judging uh, if people were sane in the Nuremberg trial was Ewan Cameron, mm -hmm. and he declared Rudolf Hess as sane, mm -hmm. but he was the one who conducted CIA MKUltra experiments on unknowing uh, people in um, Allen Memorial uh, Hospital. Whoa! In 1945, Ewan Cameron made the acquaintance of Rudolf Hess, one of the Nazis accused in the Nuremberg trial. In 1957, the CIA recruited him for their MK Ultra program. The Americans wanted to perfect their interrogation techniques and program a human to kill. Dr. Cameron was present at the Nuremberg trials. So I find that for someone who in 1945, 1946 was involved in, in, in evaluating and considering what the Nazis had done to helpless people in concentration camps was five or six years later invading people's brains. <sighs> in 1956, suffering from depression after childbirth, Mrs. Orlico was referred by her Winnipeg doctor to a top psychiatrist in Montreal. Unknowingly, she was about to become part of a cruel CIA experiment, codenamed MK Ultra. Everybody in the hospital was very much in awe of Dr. Cameron, and he strode the halls like a giant. And people would say, oh, there but for God goes God. And to me, I thought, how could he possibly ever take me for a patient? Who am I? I mean, this great man who's done all these marvelous things, and uh, boy, I better work hard, and I better do everything that he tells me to do, and, you know, I don't want to lose this opportunity to get well. Linda McDonald was subject to over 100 of these shock therapy sessions. As time went on, she went from being able to tell the doctors her name and information about herself to having her brain completely wiped. In a 1998 documentary, she states, I was, had to be toilet trained. I was a vegetable. I had no identity, I had no memory, I'd never existed in the world before, a, like a baby. They were bringing me back in time, way back, you know. At one point, I almost felt like I was just about to be uh, born, <laughs> really, that far back in memory. I'll have to, I'll have to look at, I mean, I'd love to know more. Yeah. It's pretty scary, but, and also astonishing that that's not part of the history. Like, again, I'm Jewish and I had no, I thought it was just about the gas chambers. I thought it was about the soap uh, or, you know, the, I'm not about the soap, obviously, but I, I thought that the trophies of death were just gruesome fetishistic trophies of death. But when you're talking about doctors and scientists being in charge, this has given me a lot of neural connections firing because one of the things I've been warning people, I, you know, I keep trying to tell people, don't look at 1939 when the death camps began. Look at 1931 to 1933 before the Nazis were even formally elected as yeah. a majority party because they enlisted in its two important books, Racial Hygiene and The Nazi Doctors. The Nazis brilliantly did exactly what is happening now. They enlisted doctors, doctors and professional medical organizations to be the tip of the spear for Nazi ideology and to give them status and prestige and money and task them with identifying life unworthy of life. And I'm sure you know this history, but that's the very first pre-death camp, you know, identifying mentally feeble or, or uh, mentally impaired teenagers and sending them off for care. And then their parents never got them back. They got a telegram. Um, this was this was doctors. It was and it was the same language, racial hygiene. You know, hygiene, public health, public health and safety. Uh, you know, protecting the Aryan uh, body politic from infection. And then it always you know metastasizes to the gypsies, the Jews, the homosexuals, infecting. You know, bringing contagion um, with our you know corruption and degeneracy, but also physical contagion. So. Uh, they're just doing what they've done before. And I tried to warn people, this is not new. This is, it's, it was a script. They just dusted it off. 
and 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 then the the uh, two tier society. I mean, I write about this uh, as a Jew, right, or even as an American familiar with Jim Crow laws. How do we not hear the echo when I walk into my hotel and I want to go sit at a lunch counter and they say, you are not vaccinated, you cannot sit at this lunch counter. You know, we'll call the police to take you out of here. It's what happened. But so the creepy thing I'm also hearing is we all noticed that there was like delusional cult-like thinking among many people who complied and ultimately many vaccinated people. Please don't tell me that there was something in the propaganda that they were aiming at these people that broke down their personalities such that they all share these personality characteristics. Because you you literally hear the same things from these people when you try to bring up issues. Are you a doctor? You're not a doctor. You know that why would the authorities lie to us? You know, like that's just conspiracy thinking. Your sources are not real. They're the sources that Pfizer was using. You know, it's it's a script and it's scary to see people you love. Um, having the same responses as any number of other yeah. critically thinking people who are supposed to think for themselves. Are you saying that that happened? Well, you say uh, the word, it's a script, and uh, that is uh, uh, computer language, actually. And the smartest people in the world, like Stephen Hawkins, and, and but also Elon Musk, and high people at Google, and many people in Silicon Valley, they say we live in a holographic universe. No, no. Or we live in a matrix. Oh, or we no. live in a simulation. Oh, I don't want to believe that. And, uh, I personally find that I gravitate more towards the information theoretic point of view and, and believing that, uh, that I'm, I, the universe that I exist in is a very good, high quality simulation. On October 4th, Alain Aspect, John Clauser, and Anton Zeilinger were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for proving that the universe isn't locally real. In the last they decades, there, I think there were more than a hundred scientific proofs that that is the case. No. And, um, so you're saying as you dig deeper, you find computer code writ in the fabric of the cosmos into the equations that we want to use to describe the cosmos, yes. Computer code. Computer code, strings of bits of ones and zeros. It's not just sort of resembles computer code, you're saying it is computer code. It's not even just is computer code, it's a special kind of computer code that was invented by a scientist named Claude Shannon in the 1940s. So, so are you saying we are all just, there's some entity that programmed the universe and we're just expressions of their code? I mean, when I look around with my meat eyeballs, I see trees and houses, rocks, and a camera. But I know that these things I see aren't actually what they really are. I mean, when we see colors, we're seeing photons of electromagnetic radiation emitted or reflected from the objects around me. The color green that I see, so much green, isn't green at all. It's just photons with a wavelength of 495 to 570 nanometers jiggling photoreceptors in my eyeballs. I think that's the technical term for it. Which my brain uses to construct an idea of the world around me. Am I feeling the ground beneath my feet? No, again, my brain is interpreting signals from nerves that tell me that I'm standing. No. And um, so how easy would it be if you, if this is a, a, a digital reality, uh, just very high definition with feelings and thoughts and that's and, but and, and very high definition VR glasses that we just forgot that we put them on, uh, um, and that where we look at that world is being built, and um, and that the Big Bang is not a Big Bang that was actually a boot of uh, a computer program. Oh my God! Starting up, so we lose we use a lot of computer language and that's actually very accurate and how easy it is uh, certainly looking at 
this horrific mind control experiments uh, on how to implement certain thoughts mm -hmm. or memories right. for that right. matter on a complete a civilization. Total civilization. Well, I won't go as far as you just did till I see those sources. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm open to anything at this point because yep. as you know from reading my book, starting in 2020, I concluded that we're no longer living in human history. It's not normal human history. No. There's something Satan affecting is and Satan is insufficient, but there is an evil force that has majestic capabilities to, and that unfolded globally that literally reoriented the missions of our major institutions into their opposites overnight. So yeah. hospitals used to heal, now they're murdering people. Journalism used to pretend to seek truth, now it spews lies without hesitation. You know, one could go on. But um, I'm so I'm not going to conclude that yet, but I guess my, my worry, I, I think there's a, I will go so far as to say, I think that the role of AI allowed the lockdowns and the delusionality in a way that we had never seen before. So, you know, AI could be Moloch, you know, like metaphorically, right? Um, or AI could be Moloch's tool, right? Yeah. Or these dark forces. Yeah. And I don't mean Moloch literally, but I, uh, people yeah. who read this book know yeah. that I think a dark energy has entered the planet starting yeah. 2020 that is uh, the opposite of the like Judeo-Christian social contract that the West had you know, that the, the United States was founded on. We have freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, but it was a, a nation devoted to God, yeah. right? But, um, so not going as far as you just went, my, uh, I'm willing to say about that delusional quality, Michael Nels, I'm sure you know, wrote a really good book called The Indoctrinated Brain. He's a German neuroscientist, and he, like, it's a Venn diagram with what you just said about propaganda and MK mm -hmm. Ultra, because he's saying the combination of the shots which damage the brain, and um, and the repetition of the uh, propaganda do break down people's sense of identity and erase their memories, such that they do they feel their and this resonated to me with personal experience. He says they then reconstruct their identity around the script. Yep. So if you raise questions about the script, y people react like you're threatening their very self. And I've seen sophisticated people, scientists, educated people leave the room when I showed them my, my sourcing because yes. they couldn't, I, no, I, I, they I couldn't engage with that. Der Bayer Direktor Fritz Termeer wurde 1948 zu sieben Jahren Haft verurteilt wegen Verbrechen gegen das Menschenrecht, Plünderung, Sklavenarbeit, Massenmord etc. Der Chef einer Industrie des weltgrößten Pharmaunternehmens, das sich auf der Erde feiern ließ als die barmherzigen Samariter und die Retter der Menschheit, verurteilt wegen Verbrechen gegen das Menschenrecht. Warum zeige ich Ihnen das? Wir werden oft gefragt. Es kann nicht sein, Dr. Rath oder Dr. Seemann oder Dr. Nitzwicki, dass dieser Industriezweig tatsächlich das Leben von Millionen Menschen riskiert. Das glauben wir nicht. Wir antworten, die haben es schon mal gemacht. Es wurde nur alles zugedeckt. Diese 40.000 Seiten mussten wir ausgraben in den Nationalarchiven. Sie waren nirgendwo im Internet zu finden. Versteckt. I think it's good to mention uh, to people what my understanding is uh, about how powerful about how powerful we are uh, in this uh, incredible times we live in is that Uh, if you think about uh, an Indian Brahman who can uh, say, well, there's a snake and he's poisonous, but here's my arm and bite me. That person can do that because he is the owner of his reality and he decides what gets into his body. Mm. Right. 
and he has no side effects, let alone that he dies. He can just n do it because he knows. And I think we are, everybody is as powerful as that. And we have a, a placebo effect and we have a nocebo yeah. effect, mm -hmm. which can, we can use in all kinds of ways, mm -hmm. but we can steer it. Interesting. So uh, you can say mm -hmm. that f with the vaccination, uh, for example, uh, backwards in time, mm -hmm. that you are deciding what they shot into you. Oh, wow. Can I do it for someone else? Of course. Okay. But the main, uh, and that's very, um, uh, what is crucial is that you have to do it in your heart and not from your brain, because your brain is in the digital world and your heart is not. And your heart, what you do in your heart, that overrides uh, the reality here. Well, thank God for that construct and that information point, because my immediate question to you, of course, is if, say it's all the matrix, right? Mm -hmm. Which I really don't want to believe. Mm -hmm. How do we have any free will at all, let alone why should I believe that if we align with God, it's going to actually save us, which I actually do believe. Well, that would take uh, another uh, uh, interview to uh, elaborate on well, that. Well, let me ask you this. Where's our freedom? Like if I tell, if I say to the people of the Netherlands, let's be free together. Yeah. Here's some ideas about how to be free, you know, go after these laws and these laws and got to leave Europe and so on. Um, and don't be scared, you know, and, and they say it to me, right? Because I'm yeah. learning as much as I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sharing. Does our commitment to liberty override or disempower all of the systems that are trying to suppress us? And if so, how? Because if they own the matrix, I don't see how that works. Well, yeah, that's a very deep and, and uh, a question. But my understanding, and to give a, a brief uh, idea about that, is that um, the freedom is only in our hearts. Mm. This is not a free world. We have a fallen world. We as a society, it's very uh, peculiar and strange that nobody actually knows who he is or where he came from or what he's doing here in a, in a real sense. And uh, so that gives an indication that there's a, a, a kind of collective hypnosis and which you override if you are really living in your heart and in truth. So uh, I would say uh, truth is more important than freedom hmm. because uh, uh, freedom can come in many ways. Mm -hmm. And I think the highest protection of who you really are mm -hmm. is to stick to truth. Mm -hmm. Because the truth, the act, that's actually quantum physics as well, mm -hmm. because the, quant the quantum field yep. is a truth field. Yep. And uh, the force, and to use that uh, analogy, can only work with what's real. Uh -huh. So The force, the divine force, there's a divine force in spite yeah, of these evil Yeah, that's a whole uh, other thing. Okay. But everybody can call it the way uh, he or she wants. Uh, let's, call it, let's call it the divine force. He works only with what's real and what's true. Okay. So if you want the, to work with the force in your life, you have to be real. Well, is the force you more powerful than the matrix in your view? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's reassuring. But it's what is the most liberating is that you shouldn't care because what you're feeling on mm -hmm. the inside mm -hmm and know who you are is knowing actually you're eternal right and when you want this world above all then you have you are scared mm -hmm. and we have to overcome that scaredness right well jesus dying. jesus certainly said everything you just said so i i'm, I'm willing to credit i mean that i i believe you uh, I do want to gently push back a little on, you know, I'm hearing a bit of a thread that I'm worried about from my new friends in the Netherlands. And what I mean is 
thread, like a thread, a theme. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, here's what I'm worried about. I love this country, and I love the history of this country, the people, the culture. The Several times I came here in the before times, it was a free society. Mm-hmm. Um, what I feel now is that, and it's so interesting, and I'm going to write about this, is that this shows us the future a little bit, you know, like three or five years down the line from where the U.S. is going to go if we don't stay vigilant. Because what they've done is they've created this picture-perfect uh, superficiality where if you don't color outside the lines, your life is pretty great, yeah. um, but there's a shadow over everything, yeah. and the shadow is the threat of a lack of freedom or what happens to you if you you know, step outside the lines. Yeah. So where, what I guess I want to do is reflect to my beloved European country, the Netherlands, just like I hope to do to other beloved European countries, that that is a dramatic change. And what I want to reflect back to you with friendship and love is that the way you just described like that state of inner truth and inner freedom is how dissidents talk, used to talk in the Soviet Union that they can't do anything to you because if you're free inside, you're free. And I want to return us, but especially my beloved Netherlands, to the immediate question, because I'm not willing to say it's a matrix, there's nothing I can do about it. I, you know, I think we, we that's need... That's not what I'm saying. No, I understand. Okay. I understand that's not what you're saying. I apologize. I need to know more about your thoughts and sources there, but I'm not... I'm afraid and apprehensive because we need Europe, right? People recognize why they need the United States globally to not be a wreck of a country that mm-hmm. gives up on freedom. Yeah. Well, we in the rest of the world need Western Europe. You know, we need the Dutch, right? We need the British. We need the French. We need everybody to stand up. Not Right, but I don't just mean to stand up. I mean your cultural heritage has mm-hmm. something very important for all the rest of us you know the individual the rise of the middle class the role of cities the role of you know you were some of the earliest kind of republic type organizations you know the the people having a voice in their town um the the rational inquiry the enlightenment uh civilization civility open debate you know reasoned debate these are dutch values you know they came to europe through the netherlands right you were a a haven for reformers i mean curiosity exploration uh mapping the world science you know these are dutch values they they and they came to the new world i mean the dutch settled my state before the british settled my state right and all our place names are still dutch I live on the role of Jansen Kill, you know, so um, where I'm going is you have this precious heritage and the globalists are trying to wipe it out. We haven't talked about immigration, but that's one of the tools, you know, illegal immigration. I'm the daughter of an immigrant, granddaughter of immigrants. It's not a racist to notice that a globalist tactic is to destroy our cultures, destroy our ability to talk to each other by just throwing humans at us from all over yeah. the world. So, and the British, you know, cradle of, of, of freedom of speech, home of John Milton, home of the Aeropagitica, you know, the French, the, the, the revolution, like all of these heritages, you know, the Judeo-Christian heritage, it is precious. The idea that there are Ten Commandments, you don't traffic children, you don't kill your elders. These are not random things that just happen because humans evolved. These came through the Judeo-Christian tradition, which you know, emerged out of the Middle East and yeah. settled in the West. Yeah, I think it's also important to not only shed a light on the positive things in the Netherlands or all cultures, but that it really went two ways in the Netherlands because we are also, uh, we did some really nasty, mean stuff that is still going on today. One uh, example, eh, we, we Created the money mm. uh, system, right? And uh, but also, and and uh, one spin-off of that is that we are a tax haven. Oh, interesting. And uh, uh, that is actually robbing the world as we speak in a enormous way. That um, and because multinational corporations don't pay tax in the Netherlands, mm. and so they rob. Really, really. Wow. And. Um, and we have special copyright laws and every every country every uh, corpor- corporation of other countries that come to the netherlands they get special tra- tax treaties hmm. and um, one organization that's somo that that 
uh, calculated this for um, Zambia. Mm -hmm. And we like to think of ourselves in the Netherlands as a very generous country. So we give Zambia each year uh, 2 million uh, euros wow. to, for development. But they calculated that only in Zambia uh, and only for that, for uh, that which they could see, and there's of course a lot which they cannot see, mm -hmm. uh, that we rob the uh, Zambian people of 2 billion each year right. because these companies don't pay tax. I in, see. Oh, in wow. Zambia. In Zambia. And uh, I think two thirds of all the multinationals in the world are based in Amsterdam. Wow. So we are robbing the world. Oh my God, I and did when, not know any of this. And when, wow. and when that came out on television, mm -hmm. we had a discussion about this. And because we do earn a little, 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 little bit of uh, tax uh, in this, one and a half billion dollars, suppose, I think the amount that's known mm -hmm. that goes through our country uh, is, I think, uh, 50 times our uh, gross national uh, Wow. Product. Yeah. So I had the, no idea. So, wow. And there are all kinds of this stuff Isn't as that well. Interesting that so, you're, oh my God, your role, like I learned about your role in medieval and then early Renaissance capitalism. Yeah. But now it's morphed into this. Yeah. It's kind of a digital global version of the same role, yeah. right? The world's money changers and the yeah. world's marketplace and the world's call it, you know, place where colonial goods come to be yeah. turned into value. Wow. So that's why I loved your plea to rebuild every institution. Ah. And I have to, uh, we're late already. Okay. 10 minutes. Oh. Um, but if I may, mm -hmm. uh, can I ask you about that? What, what, uh, how you see it, what kind of institutions, if you see examples yes. already. Uh, and because I found it really encouraging and hopeful right. to hear it from you that we need to do that. So I will answer that, but I just want to go back to what I was wanting to make sure it's part of the answer. Yeah. I, I said, right, about like the danger of accepting that you're in a post-freedom society instead of fighting to be a national sovereign nation a republic where people know how to draft their own bills pass their own bills lobby their legislators um that's the gold standard that in my view in my you know humble but considered view mm. all of europe has to get back to the united states has to go go back to canada australia and so on it's the only way to be free okay and to to maintain your freedom because things might be manageable now but if you don't have that uh it won't be so pretty on the surface people start being dragged away to quarantine camps which my governor in new york state is trying to establish people will start to lose their kids to social services for wrong think people will start to be denied food if their social credit score goes down through the digital currency that's the next step for europe if you don't get your sovereignty back and yeah. you figure out how to pass legislation S on a local and national level um so rebuilding institutions i keep going back to the legislative process i don't know i haven't looked about how to pass a bill in your parliament or if it means anything given the eu superstructure but that is the number one thing people watching this podcast need to do see if they can find that dutch legislative database see if it's e easily searchable because a lot of these databases are made opaque and yeah. and and then draft your own laws, figure out the process, it goes through your parliament, figure out how to lobby your representative, figure out how to offer threats, nonviolent threats, but I will vote you out, I will vote your party out, um, or rewards, I will pass out your literature, I'll host a potluck, I'll, you know, inform people of your policies on my social media, meet with your representatives, right, meet with their chiefs of staff. This may not yet be possible, but a change of culture makes things possible. And if a lot of Dutch people start calling their party officials and saying, I have 50 neighbors, we don't want the WHO treaty, we want a meeting with you, um, maybe they'll give you a meeting. You know, and if they don't, let people know, publicize it. But that involves, the second thing I want to say to people is rebuilding your society from the ground up requires courage. Uh, but I want to reassure people, it requires much less courage now then it's going to you three years from now or five years from now. Yeah. And the way fascist coups go, people are scared to talk right now because they don't want to be kicked out of their job or they don't want to be kicked out of their play group or ostracized on social media or canceled. 
none of those things are as dangerous as what's going to happen in three to five years if you don't speak up now. Yeah. Um, so now's the time. And I guess the other thing is the Dutch know best what institutions and institutional reforms the Dutch need. Just yeah. like, you know, Australians know best what they need. French know best what they need. So I would say convene 30 to 50 of your friends and neighbors in a potluck. I love potlucks. I think they're revolutionary. Yeah. Um, in real time, because you, they want us to be digital all the time because they can surveil us and censor us. And sharing food is a radical act. And sketch out, you know, what are the skill sets in the room? Like if you get 50 Dutch people together in a room, you'll have a force multiplier. You'll have a doctor. You'll have a teacher. You'll have a, a, a construction worker. You'll have people with so many knowledge bases, moms, you know, like incredible knowledge bases and capabilities. What do we need? You need to know where your food is coming from and secure it, right? Plant a garden. Well, you're very good at that in Holland. Or, you know, know, know help the farmers, help the, change the laws to have freedom of, of food, which we're having good laws in the United States. You know, yeah. making sure local distributors can sell their milk, sell their meat, sell their produce. Um, you need education. I understand it's very difficult, if not impossible, to homeschool your kids. Well, stop that right away. Change those laws yeah. so that you can start your own schools. Yeah. You know, home-based schools, neighborhood schools, they're going to propagandize the heck out of your kids if they haven't already. So secure the school system. Start those schools, right? Even if it's after hours, even if it's kicking a soccer ball in the park, you know, organize with your neighbors to start those educational influences on the children so it's not all the state. Um, you need to... I think you need to get your guns back. So you need to pass laws getting the guns back. The you you need the Second around. Amendment. Yeah. You need the First Amendment. You need to get rid of these hate speech laws, right? I can't believe the Netherlands or Europe has hate speech laws. Anything is hate speech, yeah. right? Yeah, and or misinformation, silence, right? So you you need like go to go to a website, download our Constitution and our Bill of Rights, <laughs> duplicate the First Amendment, Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment, and contact your representatives and say we want to have a constitution that has these uh, these rights in it and start a movement to do that. Um, leave the EU, right? Yeah, the world, Gotta leave actually the EU. Actually, we don't have to recognize the EU because it's uh, quasi-legal. Uh, it's not legal. It's, right. it's just not legal. Right, but I think you have to roll back all the regulations and yeah, laws that... Definitely. that that claim, yeah. you know, sovereignty over the Netherlands. Poland is doing that at the moment. Can I say some, one other thing, which is very dear to my heart? Yeah. Um, they're trying to erase your culture and your mm -hmm. history. Um, and we've talked a little bit about immigration as one way to do it. Same with my country and our history. Uh, it's so important for you to ask people to send to a central archive, and it can be in a neighbor's house for now, right? Until you raise money for a real archive. Old history books, old textbooks. Um, old biographies and novels about Dutch history, Dutch literature, yeah. um, not expurgated, not censored. Maybe there are things in there that are not politically correct. Too bad. That's history, you know, and you need to save those because that's Google is literally scrubbing our histories. Change. I was looking before the, the camera started for George Washington's quote about winter soldiers. Mm -hmm. All Google gives me now is a Marvel comic. <laughs> yeah. Right, and yeah. and that's happening to our our statues, our histories, our national yeah. identities around the world. So, cook Dutch food, save those recipes. You know, photograph Dutch uh, traditional uh, costumes. Do a little homemade exhibit. Like, do it yourselves. Right, don't wait for the council. Um, you know, interview your elders. What was the Netherlands like in the 30s and 40s and 50s? Um, don't let them tear down your statues. Don't let them tear down your historic buildings. Uh, sing the national anthem. You know, like, I don't know all the things Dutch people do that are Dutch, but you, you have to reject the idea that being proud of being Dutch is racist or right-wing nationalism, right? Yeah. It is not racist to want a country and to protect your culture, right? That's not a racial thing. That no. is a country thing and a cultural thing. Um, and so those are just some steps, uh, but really it, it starts, and I'll agree with you here for sure, with a change of heart and being willing to speak your truth, even if you face opprobrium, you lose one position, I promise you God is going to open another you know, door for you. Um, and I do have every faith in the Dutch. You guys have done it before. 
you know, you've thrown off the yoke of, of occupation and, and enforced servitude. You saved a lot of my people, you know, at great risk to yourselves. Um, so I have every, every confidence in the Dutch people and their, their fight for freedom. Wow. It's great to hear from you. Thank you. I thank you very much for uh, taking the time uh, to do this interview and to come to the Netherlands. Thank you. And uh, of course, uh, for living the way, uh, um, the way you do. The, thank uh, you. That's uh, a sure example of bravery. Thanks thank a lot you. for that. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.